one of the sentinel Earth-observing satellites. They occupy low Earth orbits that take them over the poles. In similar orbits, the swarm satellites monitor changes in the Earth's magnetic field. In a much higher orbit, the GOES weather satellite hovers above the United States. It orbits at the same rate that the Earth revolves. The New Horizons probe does not orbit anything. It was launched on a flyby mission past Pluto and it continues into the Kuiper belt. Satellites are expensive. Designed to operate at extreme temperatures in the vacuum of space, they cannot be maintained. They must perform faultlessly for years. Yet every satellite depends on the brute force and precision of a launcher to deliver it to an exact orbit. Uh, are expensive too. They have varying capabilities and varying reliability, but new developments in rocket technology are changing what can be achieved and how much it will cost. The days of giant state-owned corporations launching their own satellites are over. Rocket builders sell their services to commercial or government clients. In October 2014, an Antares rocket built by Orbital Sciences was set to ferry supplies to the International Space Station. The launchers are generally reliable, but space is difficult. There is still a 7% failure rate. This fundamental step of leaving the Earth's surface relies on a small group of international companies that build heavy lift rockets. The most iconic booster in operation today is the Russian Soyuz. It's not the biggest or most powerful launcher, but its history stretches back to the earliest days of space exploration. Variants of the Soyuz launcher have been in continuous production since 1957, and they have made more than 1,800 trips to orbit. Since the demise of the Space Shuttle, the Soyuz remains the only human-rated launcher in operation, and both ESA and NASA rely on it to ferry people to and from the International Space Station. It is a direct descendant of the Vostok launcher that sent the first man into space. On the 12th of April 1961, Yuri Gagarin rose to orbit on Vostok 1, designed by Sergei Korolev. The design, featuring a central core surrounded by four strap-on boosters, was originally conceived as the first nuclear missile. But as Soviet warheads became lighter, the launcher was adapted for manned trips to low Earth orbit. Today, four variants of the Soyuz launcher are in operation, and they launch from four different sites. Many of the simple design features in the Soyuz have contributed to its reliability and low cost. It was estimated that Russia could launch 20 expendable Soyuz carriers for the cost of one space shuttle launch. Though the basic layout of the Soyuz is still recognizable after 60 years, it has evolved. 
The design has seen several generations of engine upgrade, with the guidance system continually being refined. Final assembly at the launch site sees the four distinctive boosters flanking the central core attached first. In Russian, they're known as carrots. Each booster and the core have one rocket motor discharging through four main fixed chambers. For guidance, the boosters have two additional small swiveling nozzles on their outer edges, while the core has four guidance nozzles. With the boosters and central core united, the assembly is now lifted onto its specially adapted railway truck. At this stage, it weighs just over 20 tonnes. When it's fueled, it will be more than 250 tonnes. The four boosters are known as the first stage. Even though they ignite at the same time as the central core, that's known as the second stage. Then, if the assembly is taking place in Russia or Kazakhstan, the third stage and the payload are fitted. This is the Gamma Ray Astronomy Satellite Mikhailo Lomonosov, being prepared for the first launch from Russia's new cosmodrome at Vostochny in Siberia. The launcher and satellite are all assembled horizontally, a technique that is straightforward and practical. At Baikonur, the original Soviet launch site still leased by Russia from Kazakhstan, rollout usually happens at dawn. Baikonur is the only launch site where the Soyuz can carry a human payload. All of the Soviet Union's history-making flights started from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The area's sparse population was one of the main reasons the Kazakhstan location was chosen. The rocket is delicately moved towards the firing ring, where it will be held in place by the four tulip petal arms. It takes about one hour to bring the launch vehicle to the vertical. As the lifting arm withdraws, the four support arms are joined by fuel and electrical umbilicals and two halves of the service gantry. Ground staff will have access to every part of the launcher and the cosmonauts will enter their spacecraft via this gantry. Technicians will spend the next two days checking the rocket and preparing it for launch. When fully loaded with fuel, its weight will increase by a factor of 15 to 305 metric tons. Soyuz carrier rockets also launch from the European spaceport at Kourou in Guyana. And from here, the rocket is erected without its payload. Because of the equatorial location, the Earth's spin makes it easier to reach orbit. A Soyuz launch from Kourou can lift considerably heavier payloads to orbit than it could from a Russian launch site. However, Kourou's tropical location has 10 times the annual rainfall of Baikonur, and a mobile gantry that protects the rocket is necessary. Like the other European launchers, the satellite is attached to the Soyuz while it is vertical. Five hours prior to launch, the fuel is gradually introduced. The liquid oxygen boils at minus 182 degrees C and it is constantly replenished. At 36 seconds, the first umbilical mast retracts, leaving the rocket on internal power. Soon after, the fuel connection swivels away and the turbo pumps begin feeding fuel and oxygen to the engines. The engines are closely monitored as they are gradually brought up to full thrust. A guidance computer in the third stage maintains the launcher's attitude via the vernier nozzles around the first and second stage chambers. 
Near the two-minute mark, the boosters shut down and are jettisoned. At 85 kilometers, the payload fairing splits and falls away. Five minutes after liftoff, and at a height of 169 kilometers, the third stage takes over to accelerate the satellite and its upper stage to escape velocity. Less than 10 minutes after launch, the upper stage guides the satellite to its designated orbit, while the rest of the launcher falls back to Earth. The American Delta IV Heavy is designed to orbit massive payloads or to hurl probes out of Earth orbit at incredible speeds. When it first flew in 2004, it had the greatest lifting capability available. The first and second stages, as well as the two boosters, are all powered by cryogenic hydrogen and oxygen. It can lift more than 28 metric tons to low Earth orbit. The Delta IV Heavy is made by the United Launch Alliance, a collaboration between Lockheed Martin and Boeing. It was designed to meet US military requirements. It has launched two NASA missions, but its other eight launches have been classified reconnaissance satellites. Services have not been sold to commercial clients. Recently, a Delta IV Heavy was prepared for perhaps its most significant launch. It was mated with the Parker Solar Probe and its star upper stage. The Parker Probe will be the first satellite to fly into the Sun's corona. And though its launch weight of just 685 kilos may seem puny for such a large launcher, Parker must leave the Earth's orbit at near record speed. After a brief period in a parking orbit, the second stage reignited to break the bonds of Earth's gravity. The final kick, delivered by the solid-fueled upper stage, gave the Parker probe the second fastest departure from Earth, and with the help of the Sun's gravity, it will reach 668,000 kilometers per hour, making it the fastest man-made object ever. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. In 2001, SpaceX founder Elon Musk hatched a scheme to establish a greenhouse on Mars and began trying to buy a Russian launch system. The space industry laughed, but they're not laughing now. Because he couldn't buy a rocket, he built his own. Musk knew American launches were too expensive, and a little research convinced him he could undercut the established aerospace giants. In design and manufacture, SpaceX focused on simplicity and reliability with a view to keeping costs down. The Falcon 9 rocket and the Dragon spacecraft packed the science and supplies for the International Space Station, humanity's home in lower orbit. In 2012, SpaceX flew the first commercial resupply mission to the International Space Station. SpaceX designed its own spacecraft, the Dragon, to carry out these resupply missions. To date, okay, SpaceX has completed 11 successful supply trips to the ISS, with seven more booked. 
Unlike all the other cargo ships that visit the space station, the Dragon is capable of returning to Earth. The Falcon 9, the company's workhorse, was criticized because it has nine separate rocket motors. Old rocket engineers argued that there were too many moving parts with a higher risk of failure. The Merlin engine, developed for the original Falcon 1, continues to be refined, giving the Falcon 9 a steadily improving lift capacity. Past the speed of sound, it's now subsonic. Soon it became clear what the multiple engines could achieve. Without its fuel load, the spent first stage falling back through the atmosphere was very light, and just one engine could enable a soft landing. If this worked, it meant reusable stages would drastically cut the cost of launches. A pinpoint landing on a remotely controlled barge required so many new techniques, and space experts were skeptical. A landing leg had collapsed and was redesigned. Soon, these return trips were routine. Though landing capability reduced the maximum payload by 30%, it also drastically reduced launch fees. Next came the Falcon Heavy, essentially three Falcon 9s strapped together. In 16 years, SpaceX had gone from laughing stock to builder of the world's most powerful launch vehicle. This first flight was to be a pure demonstration. Its dummy payload was Elon Musk's red Tesla Roadster. The car would go into orbit around the sun. called for the two boosters to land back at Cape Canaveral. The central core would return to a barge at sea. Potential customers were watching the demonstration closely, and crowds who gather along the Florida coast to see a launch now wait to watch boosters returning. The car, rigged with cameras, went into a solar orbit, but in the mission's one failure, the central core missed its barge. The US Air Force will be the Falcon Heavy's first paying customer. The entry into the launch market of a company aggressively trying to reduce the cost of access to space is changing the space business. Today, SpaceX remains the only launch provider that openly publishes the cost of its services. The Ariane 5 is the European Space Agency's heavy lift rocket. It features a liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen first stage, flanked by two solid fuel boosters. Though the Ariane 5 is not the most powerful launcher, it holds the record for heaviest payload to geosynchronous transfer orbit. The equatorial launch site in Guyana makes orbits of low inclination easier to achieve and is an attractive feature for paying clients. The Ariane 5 ECA is the fifth and final version of the 5 Series, which will soon be replaced by the Ariane 6. A new version of the Vulcane rocket engine is being developed for Ariane 6, which will be cheaper to build and to launch. New facilities are being constructed for the Ariane 6 at the Kourou spaceport, including a new vehicle assembly building, which will see a change from vertical to horizontal integration. But the Ariane 5 still has much to do. 18 launches are scheduled before its replacement begins flight testing. The stages are fabricated in Europe 
and crossed the Atlantic by ship. At the launch site, the central stage is raised to the vertical. Slightly more than 30 meters long, the core stage is essentially a fuel tank divided into two compartments with a rocket engine at its base. Each solid fuel booster arrives on its table in an upright position and preloaded with propellant. The upper stage, that will on this mission deliver four Galileo navigation satellites to their target orbits, is fitted. The satellites, clustered about a central dispenser, are then attached to the upper stage before the fairing that protects them during the trip up through the atmosphere is lowered into place. The Ariane, on top of the launch platform, begins its journey at a snail's pace. The Ariane 5 is operated by Ariane Space, who have launched more than half the commercial satellites in operation today. Russia's heavy lift proton launcher started its life in 1965. It was originally designed to carry a 100 megaton thermonuclear weapon to targets in the US. It was never deployed as a missile, instead evolving into a successful heavy launcher. It delivered several modules to the International Space Station, and one of its recent high-profile successes was the launch of the first ExoMars probe. But the Proton has not been without its problems. Developed during the Soviet era, its manufacturer Khrunichev was reliant on the Ukraine for key components. And when launched from Baikonur, the Kazakh government was not keen on the extremely toxic hypergolic fuel it used. There are claims that acid rain falls after some launches, and that parts of Russia and Kazakhstan are being poisoned by the unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine that powers the proton. At Baikonur in July 2013, a Proton-M was set to launch three Russian GLONASS navigation satellites. Investigation found that the rate gyro package had been installed upside down. It was not the only recent proton failure, and questions about quality control were being asked. Though the proton still has launch commitments for several years, it will be phased out. Startup company Space Lab is poised for its first commercial launch. Their rocket, called the Electron, can deliver light satellites to low Earth orbit at prices that completely undercut the rest of the market. The launcher makes extensive use of carbon fiber in the construction of the tanks, and Space Lab has developed an engine with a radically new fuel cycle. Named after physicist Ernest Rutherford, the engine is largely constructed with 3D printing techniques. The liquid oxygen RP-1 fueled unit uses brushless electric motors to operate its turbo pumps instead of pre-burning fuel for the same purpose. The batteries powering the process add weight, but they save on fuel and give engineers finer control when throttling the engine. The launch site on New Zealand's North Island Mahia Peninsula is perfect for the busy schedule that Rocket Lab envisions. With the advent of microsatellites, smaller carriers like the Electron are becoming an attractive launcher for a new area of the launch market. 
The International Space Station is a laboratory that orbits the Earth once every 90 minutes. It's the most expensive single project ever constructed. Jointly owned and operated by the United States, Russia, Europe, Japan and Canada, the ISS is a triumph of international collaboration. But it didn't start that way. And during its planning phase, it came close to being dumped. Tonight, I am directing NASA to develop a permanently manned space station and to do it within a decade. It was 1984, toward the end of the Cold War, when President Ronald Reagan unveiled his plan before the Congress. It was soon called Space Station Freedom, but details were sketchy and plans kept changing. NASA saw a space station as their next logical step. The Space Shuttle had been designed with on-orbit construction as one of its primary functions. On a cold morning in January 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger was being prepared for its tenth flight. And liftoff, liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower. All seven astronauts were killed, and the shuttle program was suspended. Just one month later, cosmonauts began occupation of Mir, the new Soviet space station. The Soviet Union had a long-standing interest in extended-duration space flights with its Salyut space stations. And with Mir, the Russians were gaining valuable experience in microgravity research and on-orbit construction. As the 80s progressed, Mir expanded using modular fabrication techniques. They began experimentation with automated docking systems. New modules were delivered by the Proton launcher with the Progress cargo ship used for resupply. NASA's shuttle fleet remained grounded while an exhaustive inquiry was conducted and Space Station Freedom was stuck on the drawing board. In 1989, discontent in Poland spread across the Eastern Bloc, leading to the fall of the wall that had divided Germany. Two years later, the Soviet Union itself was dissolved, followed by social and economic turmoil. Moscow was now the capital of the Russian Federation, a one-party democracy. The Mir crew EO-10 arrived at the space station as Soviet citizens and would return to the ground as Russians. The country's new space agency, Roscosmos, had had its budget slashed by 80% and there was no money to launch two newly completed modules. In 1988, NASA had resumed shuttle flights, but with the fall of the Soviet Union, interest among US politicians in space station freedom was at an all-time low. NASA now began working with Roscosmos. In the shuttle Mir program, the Russians would benefit from an injection of badly needed funds, and the Americans would gain expertise in long-duration spaceflight. Astronauts learned Russian and began riding to orbit in the Soyuz. Cosmonauts learned English. During the program, 10 cosmonauts flew on the space shuttle, 
and eight Americans served as crew members aboard Mir, with the shuttle docking with the Russian space station nine times. Roscosmos had begun work on a replacement Mir 2 project, completing the functional cargo block and the DOS-8 habitation module, but lack of funding forced the agency to shelve the plan. NASA convinced the cash-strapped Russian Federation to come in on their project. Europe, Japan and Canada were also involved in what was now called the International Space Station. The functional cargo block was renamed Zarya and became the first piece of the International Space Station delivered to orbit in November 1998. Zarya was launched from Kazakhstan with an orbital inclination of around 50 degrees. This set the orbit for the International Space Station. The space shuttle would deliver the bulk of the modules from here on. NASA knew that this orbit would give the shuttle problems. Launched from Florida, the shuttle usually orbited at 30 degrees. To reach the steeper inclination with any meaningful payload, the shuttle needed more power or it had to lose weight. A redesign of the cargo bay delivered some weight savings, but the construction missions could only be achieved with a new external tank made from a new lightweight alloy. We have a go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour with the first American element of... Two weeks after the launch of Zarya, the Space Shuttle Endeavour lifted the Unity node to orbit. Houston's now controlling. Endeavour's rolling on a course heading northeast from the Kennedy Space Center toward a 240-mile-high rendezvous with the Zarya control module. In preparation, the crew connected the Unity node to the shuttle's airlock and, using the shuttle's robotic arm, they united the two modules. The crew entered the space station for the first time and stowed equipment, but no one would take up residence just yet. Construction work had just started. It was 18 months before the arrival of the next module, Zvezda, the Russian habitation module. It docked automatically with the Zarya module. In October 2000, the space shuttle Discovery arrived with more pieces. During four spacewalks, the crew installed a structural truss and communications equipment. Finally, in November 2000, the first crew, Expedition 1, launched from Baikonur. Cosmonaut Yuri Gidzhenko was commander of the Soyuz spacecraft. Astronaut Bill Shepard was the commander of the team once they were on the International Space Station, and Sergei Krikalev, the most experienced member of the crew was flight engineer. Much of the crew's daily activity was devoted to the unpacking and installation of equipment. There are always problems that need to be solved and maintenance to be carried out. In microgravity, muscles lose tone. One of the first pieces of equipment to be set up was an exercise bike. Every crew member is required to do two and a half hours of cardio exertion every day. Unlike later missions, Expedition 1 carried out very little scientific research. At this stage, the station's primary laboratory module was still on the ground. But that would soon change. The crew of the space shuttle Atlantis delivered the laboratory module called Destiny. It was a radical increase in capability for the space station. The laboratory is equipped with 13 international standard payload racks that can house a variety of different experiment modules, but at this stage they were empty. With the Destiny module and a new much larger solar array, the International Space Station was taking shape. 
a precisely organized launch schedule was unfolding, and it was expected that the space station would be complete by 2006. In November of 2002, the space shuttle Endeavour took off, carrying the Expedition 6 crew, plus a new piece of the space station's superstructure and two tons of supplies. Returning to the ground, no one realized that it would be the last time a cosmonaut would fly on the shuttle and that construction work on the ISS would be suspended for more than two years. Columbia, Houston, com check. When the space shuttle Columbia broke up during re-entry to the Earth's atmosphere, all remaining shuttles were grounded. Columbia, Houston, UHF, com check. 81 seconds after launch, foam insulation separating from the external tank had damaged the left wing, and from that point, Columbia was doomed. The investigation board had no confidence that the entire space shuttle fleet could be safely operated for more than a few years, calling the shuttle an aging spacecraft. With shuttle flights suspended, construction work on the International Space Station stopped. Replacement crews were cut to two members. The Russian Progress Freighter was the only method of delivering supplies to the ISS, and all crew rotations used the Soyuz spacecraft. <laughs> What started out as America's space station freedom was now completely reliant upon Russian technology. It would be more than three years before construction work on the space station recommenced. In 2004, US President George Bush made a speech to an assembled group of NASA administrators. Our first goal is to complete the International Space Station by 2010. In 2010, the Space Shuttle, after nearly 30 years of duty, will be retired from service. The Space Shuttle would be restricted to work on the International Space Station, where the crew could await rescue if their craft sustained damage. Scientific work was cut to a minimum, with the small crews preoccupied with station maintenance. Fabrication work on the modules continued on the ground. The Space Shuttle Discovery made the return to flight mission in 2005. Before docking with the International Space Station, it performed the rendezvous pitch maneuver, allowing the ISS crew to inspect the craft for damage. It delivered supplies and equipment and returned safely to the ground. Atlantis arrived 14 months later, and after a break of almost four years, construction work began again. In what became known to NASA astronauts as the Wall of EVA, that's extravehicular activity, it took 14 more shuttle assembly flights to bring the ISS to its current configuration. If just one of the installation spacewalks was to fail, it could threaten the entire project. The schedule was relentless because the shuttle's days were numbered. Training for these assembly missions was intense. NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory was rigged with a mock-up of the ISS, so astronauts could experience something akin to weightlessness while they practiced. In July 2011, Atlantis flew to the ISS on what was the final flight of the shuttle fleet. The International Space Station was essentially complete, although it continues to be reconfigured and new pieces can still be added. Its 16 pressurized modules have a volume equivalent to a five-room house, including laboratories, storage spaces, and habitation areas. Power comes from eight solar array wings, which track the sun. When the ISS enters the Earth's shadow, the solar wings enter night glider mode, where they are angled edge-on to the orbital direction. Though the ISS orbits 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface, 
There is enough thin atmosphere at that height to present drag. Night glider mode reduces this drag and minimizes orbital decay. Supplies of water, oxygen, food and equipment are regularly delivered by unmanned cargo craft. Most frequent of these has been the Russian Progress, which is similar in appearance to the Soyuz. It docks by itself using the automated KERS system. It can also be docked manually if the need should arise. Like the Soyuz capsule, the Progress freighter will remain docked long term. As well as delivering supplies, it can boost the station's orbit or it can transfer fuel for the station's thrusters. Ultimately, filled with garbage, it undocks to burn up in the atmosphere. The Japanese space agency, JAXA, currently operates the largest cargo craft that still visits the ISS. To dock with the space station, it approaches in stages until it's close enough to be grabbed by the robotic arm and connected to one of the berths on the Harmony node. It has a pressurized zone that can be unloaded by hand, and there's an unpressurized area, accessed by the robotic arm, for cargo to be stored on pallets outside. With the demise of the space shuttle, NASA has turned to the private sector to fulfill its resupply commitments. The Cygnus freighter first visited the ISS in 2014. The SpaceX Dragon cargo craft first delivered supplies to the ISS in 2012. It is different from the other cargo craft in that it can return significant loads back to the ground. Experimental materials from the ISS can be in an Earth-based laboratory within two days of leaving low Earth orbit. SpaceX is developing a Dragon capable of carrying astronauts to low Earth orbit. The business of the International Space Station is research. The study of fluid dynamics and material science in a microgravity environment simply cannot be done on the ground. And the orbiting platform is the perfect place for Earth observation, meteorological studies and astronomy. The study of plant development in microgravity is of great interest. One of the major areas of study is into the effects of prolonged weightlessness on the human body. Without the resistance provided by gravity, muscles and bone deteriorate. This is partially offset by regular exercise. The ISS is equipped with a treadmill, a cycle ergometer and a resistive exercise device. All are shock mounted so as not to pass vibration across the station. The loss of bone mass shows up as raised calcium levels in the blood. Blood samples are taken regularly and stored at low temperature for later analysis. The extra calcium can lead to kidney stones. NASA and JAXA are cooperating in the study of an agent that can prevent these effects. Most astronauts on long-term missions complain about deterioration in their vision, which can persist for years after a flight. Distinct changes to the eye have been detected and ultrasound examinations of the eyes are done regularly. Astronauts and cosmonauts are totally reliant upon the technology of the ISS and it needs regular maintenance. In August 2018, a small but steady drop in air pressure was noticed. It was traced to the Soyuz MS-9 capsule. A two millimeter hole appeared to have been deliberately drilled and nasty rumors about sabotage began to spread. Cosmonaut Sergei Prokopyev made a recording from the Soyuz to show the repairs and to quash stories about poor morale on the space station. As you see, everything is calm. We're living in harmony as always and all the experiments are going to plan. Later, it was decided that a spacewalk to cut away some of the external insulation from the Soyuz above the hole might deliver more clues about how the hole could have been made. Because the Soyuz capsule is not designed for external maintenance and lacks handrails, it was a challenging job for the cosmonauts. 
It was difficult slicing through the eight layers of the thermal blanket used to stabilize internal temperatures on the spacecraft. From the inside, it appeared that the hole had been repaired with glue, which gave out after the Soyuz had docked with the ISS. It was thought that analysis of the glue would shed more light on the mystery. Because the hole was in the habitation module, it was no threat to the craft's safe return. The blanket, which was left in a mess, is also not required during re-entry. Russian cosmonaut Sergei Prokopyev, European astronaut Alexander Gerst, and American astronaut Serena Anyon Chancellor had flown up on this spacecraft and would be returning home on it. The visible portion. When maintenance or repair work has to be done outside the ISS on NASA, ESA or JAXA modules, the crew members with the required expertise have training in the use of the American spacesuit known as the EMU. Some crew members have training on the EMU and the Russian Orland spacesuit. Those with experience in both say that the American suit is more flexible and comfortable Yet it is very complex and takes a very long time to put on. By contrast, the Russian suit is simple to put on and is designed to be easily serviced by cosmonauts. Even the smallest equipment malfunction can be life-threatening. When ESA astronaut Luca Parmitano was installing cables outside the ISS, water started leaking into his helmet. I feel a lot of water on the back of my head, but I don't think it's leaked from my back. Are you sweating? Are you working hard? Um, I am sweating, but it feels like a lot of water. Mission Control called him back inside, but by the time he had reached the airlock, he couldn't see and he couldn't hear. His colleagues quickly got him inside and removed his helmet, along with more than a litre of water. Later, the empty suit was powered up and the fault was obvious. The water was leaking from the suit's cooling system. A report blamed Mission Control, who assumed that the water was coming from the in-suit drinking water bag. A crew will typically stay in orbit for around six months. The arrival of a new crew means that for three other crew members, their stay is coming to an end. They board the same Soyuz craft in which they traveled to orbit for the return to the surface. Undocking of the capsule is precisely timed. It separates initially by the spring mechanism in the docking interface. Only at a safe distance from the ISS will the Soyuz make the first of its separation burns to avoid contaminating the space station. At a point in the orbit opposite to their intended landing area, the retro burn happens, slowing the craft for its descent into the atmosphere. This burn is precisely timed and lasts 4 minutes and 45 seconds. At this stage, the descent capsule is still attached to the habitation and instrument modules. In Kazakhstan, a fleet of ground vehicles are heading for the landing zone. Medical teams and recovery personnel from Roscosmos, NASA and ESA are also in the air. Explosive bolts fire to separate the three parts of the Soyuz. During the heat of re-entry, the crew are out of radio contact with the ground. In the upper atmosphere, the drogue chute deploys, further slowing the capsule. And then the main chute. On the ground, the crew are lifted from the capsule. They're experiencing gravity for the first time in months, and it will take them months to return to normal.
They are carried through the snow and will soon return to their homes. Some of our solar system's planets have been visited by scientific probes less frequently than others. The outer gas giants, Uranus and Neptune, are so distant they're hard to reach. Uranus is 20 times further from the Sun than Earth, while Neptune is 30 times further. Both have only been seen at close range by NASA's Voyager 2 spacecraft. Mercury is so close to the Sun that any probe sent in its direction must take a circuitous path to offset the Sun's immense gravitational influence. The Mariner 10 probe flew past Mercury in 1973, and the Messenger probe went into orbit around Mercury in 2011. Venus presents different problems. Though it's our closest planetary neighbor and easier for spacecraft to reach, dense cloud hides its features and its surface has hellish conditions. The Russian Venera craft have landed, but in the hostile environment, they could only survive for minutes. Twice every century, the planet Venus passes between the Earth and the Sun. Called the transit of Venus, it was closely observed in 1769. Astronomers realized that careful timing of Venus's passage across the face of the Sun would allow them to calculate the distance to the Sun, which in turn would unlock far more accurate methods of navigation. In 1961, the Soviet Union launched Venera 1, the first Venus probe. It passed Venus as intended, but Mission Control had lost contact with it. The following year, NASA launched Mariner 1 to Venus. A coding error led to control problems with the launcher. It was destroyed minutes after liftoff. Because convenient launch opportunities only occur in 18-month cycles, NASA had a second probe ready to launch. Mariner 2 was essentially a Ranger spacecraft designed to go to the moon. These were the early days of the space race, and the United States was desperate to catch up with the Soviet Union. Lead times were short, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory did not have time to complete its original design. In August 1962, Mariner 2 was launched. The Ranger spacecraft launched toward the moon had all failed. Mariner 2, on its way to Venus, was functioning, but its transmissions were weak, and due to a launch anomaly, it was off course. After a week, instructions for a complex course correction were transmitted to the spacecraft. About an hour later, Mariner executed the maneuver which involved a roll turn, followed by a pitch turn, and finally a main engine burn. It worked well, but several days later, the craft lost lock on the Sun and the Earth, its two attitude reference points. It corrected itself before ground control could diagnose the problem. Next, the signal strength increased to its normal level, but a short in a solar panel left it low on power. 
At this time, although both America and the Soviet Union had been sending probes toward the planets, nothing had succeeded. Mariner 2 lost several telemetry sensors and it began to overheat. It continued limping toward Venus, but some of the spacecraft's problems were solving themselves. Mariner 2 was now close enough to the sun that it could function effectively on just one solar panel. It passed slightly less than 35,000 kilometers above Venus's cloud tops. It could detect no planetary magnetic field and it recorded temperatures across the planet approaching 500 degrees Kelvin. Clearly, landing on the surface would present problems. But America wanted to focus on their first real success in space, finally doing something that the Soviets had not. Mariner 2 was the first successful interplanetary probe, and in California, the home of JPL, they celebrated. The next major advances in the exploration of Venus were made by the Soviet Union. The objective of the Venera series was to land on the surface of Venus. Designers understood that not only were the surface temperatures hot enough to melt lead, but that the atmospheric pressure was many times that of Earth. The landers they built looked more like diving bells than spacecraft. In June 1967, Venera 4 was launched. The vehicle consisted of a carrier craft with instruments used during the cruise phase to Venus and a spherical landing module that could communicate independently. After entering into the atmosphere, Venera 4's parachute opened. It sent back data for 93 minutes, but stopped 28 kilometers above the surface. Yet its electronics hadn't been overwhelmed by the heat. It had simply run out of power. Extrapolations from its final measurements showed a surface temperature of 500 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 75 atmospheres, far higher than anyone expected. The Venera program strengthened its landers and fitted smaller parachutes to reduce descent time. Launched in January 1969, Venera 5 and 6 learned more about the chemical makeup of the atmosphere, but neither remained functioning at the surface. The Venera series continued, refining the technology and making incremental improvements to mission duration, adding to the knowledge about Venus. In 1975, Venera 9 was launched. It was a new design, consisting of an orbiter-lander combination, with the orbiter able to act as a relay station for signals transmitted from the surface. Four months after launch, the orbiter and the lander, encased in a spherical shell, separated. It entered the atmosphere two days later, while the mother craft became the first probe to go into orbit around Venus, photographing parts of the surface in ultraviolet. The new lander had a ring shield that could replace a parachute during the latter stages of the descent through the dense atmosphere. Venera 9 transmitted the first black and white pictures from the surface, though a design fault meant a second camera could not eject its lens cap. Three days later, and 2,000 kilometers away, a twin craft, Venera 10, landed. It took pictures too, but the same design fault left a lens cap stuck in place. Both landers had been pre-cooled while still in space, and circulating cooling fluid kept the craft operating on the blistering surface for more than an hour. In 1983, two more Venera craft arrived at Venus. Equipped with synthetic aperture radar, they made the first serious attempt to map the surface beneath the cloud layer. 
Over eight months, they mapped from the North Pole down to 30 degrees north. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. NASA had taken a minor role in the early exploration of Venus. But in 1989, the space shuttle Atlantis lifted off carrying the Magellan probe. Magellan was bound for Venus. Like the Venera craft before it, Magellan would use radar to map the surface of the planet. It was the first interplanetary spacecraft launched from the space shuttle. Following a cruise of 15 months, Magellan arrived at Venus and entered an elliptical orbit. To keep costs down, the probe had been built from an agglomeration of spare parts left over from previous NASA missions. After some software problems, it began mapping. The images it relayed remain the highest resolution pictures we have of the surface of Venus. Pictures of low volcanic blisters emerged and lava channels were evidence of an extremely active surface. The thick atmosphere has prevented all but the largest meteors reaching Venusian ground and few impact craters were visible. Yet evidence of plate tectonics that sculpts the Earth's surface was not obvious. After mapping Venus, Magellan changed its orbit and plotted the planet's gravitational anomalies. On Venus, localized changes in gravity correspond to surface features. On Earth, this is not the case. A new naked picture of Venus emerged. The surface appears to have been completely remade around half a billion years ago. Yet while volcanoes and lava channels are common features on Venus, Magellan could not find evidence that volcanic activity still happens on the planet. In 2006, the European Space Agency's Venus Express went into orbit around Venus. Its focus was the long-term analysis of the planet's atmosphere. During its eight-year mission, it registered a sharp rise in the atmosphere's sulfur dioxide. This could be due to changes in wind patterns, but it could also be a sign of volcanic activity. Researchers also saw increases in infrared radiation coming from three different volcanic locations. More circumstantial evidence of current volcanic activity. Finally, the infrared team saw short-term temperature changes that fluctuated over just a few days. It appears that volcanoes may still be active on Venus. The mission ended in 2015 with a series of swoops into the upper atmosphere that verified unexpected ripples in the mesosphere. Very little in the way of Venus exploration has happened since Venus Express. Though elaborate plans exist for future missions to Venus, nothing at this stage has been funded. Yet many missions still pass close to Venus to use its gravitation to alter their flight paths. In 1974, Mariner 10 was the first spacecraft ever to use the gravitational slingshot effect on its way to Mercury. Italian mathematician Giuseppe Colombo devised the maneuver as a way to save fuel and to fly past Mercury not once, but several times. The technique is now commonplace. Ten days after launch, Mariner 10 executed instructions for a routine course correction. This appeared to go well, but after the burn, when the craft attempted to reorient itself, there was a problem. Mariner 10 knew where it was pointing because its tracking sensor could lock onto the star Canopus, but a flake of paint that had come from the spacecraft was confusing the system. An automated backup procedure found Canopus again, but flaking paint was an issue for the rest of the mission. 
To reach Mercury, a spacecraft must approach the Sun, and its immense gravity presents a problem. Voyages to outer planets are constantly slowed by solar gravity, but with the inner planets, a spacecraft constantly accelerates. Mariner 10 used Venus's gravity to reduce its speed, and it approached Mercury at an acute angle. Mariner 10 did not have enough fuel to go into orbit around Mercury, but its sun-centered path allowed the probe to make three close passes. Its first pass revealed a moon-like planet with a heavily cratered surface. Though Mercury is the smallest planet, it's the most dense. It has a large, iron-rich core. Prominent escarpments were seen. Here, Discovery Scarp cuts through two craters. It falls three kilometers. It's thought that these cliffs are the result of cooling and shrinking of the core. Mariner 10 continued to suffer technical problems. Its tape recorder kept sticking. There were restrictions in the rates of data transmission, and limited attitude control meant flight engineers were using solar pressure on the high-gain antenna and solar panels to compensate. Yet the mission continued. Mariner 10 could only map about 45% of Mercury's surface as the same hemisphere faced the Sun during each of its passes. Mariner 10 discovered a very thin atmosphere, primarily of helium. Several months after its third and final pass of Mercury, it ran out of fuel. It still orbits the Sun. Main engine start, two, one, and zero. It was more than 30 years before the next mission to Mercury. In 2004, Messenger was launched. It was designed to go into orbit around Mercury, which presented a number of design constraints. It featured a large woven ceramic sun shield, but it did not have a dish antenna. It would rely on a phased array that could be electronically pointed. After a year in space, Messenger was back at Earth, using its gravitation to modify its orbit. Even though it was not a large spacecraft, it had a powerful engine for course corrections and orbit insertion. It continued on to pass Venus twice to lose speed as it drew closer to the Sun. Three and a half years after launch, Messenger approached Mercury, but this was not the end of its journey. The probe made two more passes of Mercury before finally going into orbit after almost seven years in space. Mission engineers had the extra problem of always requiring the probe's sun shield to be pointed toward the sun. Because it was in orbit, Messenger was able to complete the mapping started by Mariner 10. The planet's dominant feature is the Caloris Basin. It's an ancient crater more than 1,500 kilometers across. Mariner 10 saw some of the area, but the rest had been in darkness. This map of the southern polar region uses color to represent illumination. Because Mercury's axis is not tilted, sunlight cannot penetrate deep craters near the poles. It was in these areas that Messenger discovered substantial amounts of water ice. Messenger received several mission extensions, but in 2015 it crashed into Mercury after running out of fuel. A new mission is already on its way to Mercury, Bepi Colombo, named after the designer of Mariner 10's trajectory. It's a joint effort between JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, and the European Space Agency. It will take seven years to reach Mercury. The Voyager 2 spacecraft is the only probe to have made close approaches to the two outer ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. Launched in 1977 with its twin, Voyager 1, it was able to take advantage of a rare alignment of the four outer planets, enabling it to make close observations of each one. 
In 1986, Voyager approached Uranus. In the distant past, it must have been hit by another massive body that knocked its axis sideways. Uranus has an east and a west pole, and for half its orbit, one side sees continual sun, while the other remains in darkness. It has rings which follow its north-south equator. Voyager 2 discovered 11 new moons and a misaligned magnetic field. Images that the Voyager captured showed Uranus as a bland, featureless planet. But this was because of its particular season. With images from the Hubble Space Telescope, we now know that at certain times clouds and planetary weather appear in the atmosphere. Uranus's largest moon, Miranda, was observed in detail for the first time. So chaotic is its surface that researchers thought that it must have been blown apart by some cosmic impact, with the fragments reforming. Now it's thought that tectonic forces, initiated by the gravitation of Uranus, are responsible for the Moon's jumbled appearance. As Voyager 2 left Uranus, backlighting from the Sun revealed two new rings encircling the planet. The spacecraft was now heading toward Neptune, the solar system's last planet. In the three years it would take to get there, ground engineers began preparing for unique challenges. Neptune is 30 times further from the Sun than the Earth, and the light intensity is one thousandth what it is here. For photography, time exposures would be necessary, yet Voyager 2 was traveling so fast that images would smear without special preparation. Engineers calculated just how much the craft would have to swivel while exposures were made to compensate for the probe's movement. In June 1989, Voyager 2 began returning distant images of Neptune. Across the world, people had realized that the data sent back to Earth by this spacecraft was transforming our understanding of the solar system. This was before the Internet age. Researchers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory clustered around TV sets to watch as data and images came in line by line. Neptune is a more conventional planet than Uranus. Its axial tilt is 30 degrees, and it revolves in the same direction as Earth. While Neptune is slightly heavier than its fellow ice giant Uranus, it has a slightly smaller diameter. And, though it is further from the Sun than its neighbor, Neptune emits more heat than Uranus. The planet has an internal heat source that drives more dynamic weather patterns. Voyager 2 measured wind speeds at Neptune in excess of 2,000 kilometers per hour, the fastest in the solar system. There were cirrus clouds in the atmosphere, and the probe recorded pictures of a great dark spot, similar to Jupiter's great red spot. It was an anticyclone in the southern hemisphere as large as the Earth. In 1994, when Hubble tried to find the same feature, it had disappeared, but a new dark spot was forming in the northern hemisphere. Voyager 2's last observations within the solar system were of Neptune's largest moon, Triton. Unlike all other moons in the solar system, Triton has a retrograde orbit, indicating that it was not formed at the same time as the planet, but that it had been captured. As Voyager 2 moved beyond the planets, its cameras were switched off to save power. Both voyagers continue away from the solar system, measuring the influence of the solar wind. This remains the only mission to the ice giants. On January the 19th, 2006, an Atlas V was launched.
It was a very powerful rocket with an unusually small payload. New Horizons left Earth orbit faster than any other probe. It was headed for the Kuiper belt at the outer edge of the solar system, in particular, Pluto. In a little more than a year, New Horizons reached Jupiter, where it received a gravitational assist that cut three years from its flight time to Pluto. After it passed Jupiter, the spacecraft went into hibernation, simply sending an all's well transmission once a week. It took New Horizons more than nine years to reach Pluto. Since it had departed, Pluto had lost its status as a planet. With the discovery of more objects of similar size in the Kuiper belt, it was decided that to be a planet, a body had to clear its orbit. Pluto's features surprised everyone. Here was a living planet shaped by tectonic forces, but instead of rock, the mountains were made of ice and frozen methane. And Pluto has a thin atmosphere, mainly of nitrogen. The probe continued on over Charon, Pluto's largest moon. Its icy surface has deep canyons, and some evidence suggests that it has ice volcanoes. Charon is about half the size of Pluto, and the two orbit each other. From Pluto, Charon would appear motionless in the sky. As the New Horizons probe sped away from Pluto into deep space, it began the slow process of transmitting its recorded data back to the Earth. At these distances, it takes signals four and a half hours to reach Earth, with data coming in at one kilobit per second. It took 469 days for all the Pluto information to be received back on Earth. Early in 2019, New Horizons passed trans-Neptunian object Ultima Thule, and with a mission extension, it continues exploring the outer reaches of the solar system. Our sun is a star like billions of others throughout the universe. It's a giant nuclear furnace at the center of our planetary system. And although life on Earth is completely reliant upon the sun, we also need our planet's magnetic field and atmosphere to protect us from extremes of solar radiation. Regularly, the sun ejects huge blasts of solar plasma, and on Earth, a direct hit by a coronal mass ejection will play havoc with power grids, communications, and satellites. In 1959 was a year of extreme solar activity. During September of that year, astronomer Richard Carrington was sketching sunspots when he observed an intensely bright event. Less than 18 hours later, auroras were seen around the world. They extended to low latitudes where the phenomenon is rarely seen. Telegraph operators across Europe and North America reported malfunctions, including electric shocks and sparking wires. This was the first time that solar storms had been linked with auroras and electrical and magnetic disturbances here on Earth, and it became known as the Carrington Effect. Since the 1700s, a periodic fluctuation had been observed in the number of sunspots, but a deeper insight into the sun's behavior would not emerge until 1958. James Van Allen was the chief scientist for America's first satellite, Explorer 1. It was equipped with a cosmic ray detector. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, 
The launch was successful, but the orbit achieved was highly elliptical with an apogee far greater than expected. As its altitude changed, variation in the detector's readings suggested that charged particles were trapped in bands around the Earth. These became known as the Van Allen belts. It was a discovery with far-reaching implications. The energetic charged particles that make up the Van Allen belts emanate from the Sun and are trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. They fluctuate with solar activity and they present a risk to spacecraft that have to pass through them. The previous year, physicist Eugene Parker, working at the University of Chicago, had predicted that a constant stream of charged particles would flow from the Sun. He called it the solar wind. The astronomical community was reluctant to accept this idea. Soon, his theory was vindicated as early Russian and American spacecraft began detecting a constant stream of charged particles. Solar wind explained why a comet's tail always points away from the Sun. Parker's supersonic solar wind theory predicted a variable stream of plasma, charged particles, permeating the solar system. The Earth's magnetic field deflects most of the solar wind, preserving the Earth's atmosphere. In 1995, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory was launched. SOHO monitors the Sun from a point where the gravity from Earth and from the Sun exert equal force, keeping the probe in a stable orbit. SOHO gives us a clear picture of the solar wind. Its LASCO instrument obscures the central disk of the Sun, revealing the corona the Sun's atmosphere. The planets are also clearly visible. The horizontal lines flanking them are due to their brightness overwhelming the camera's sensor. SOHO's extreme ultraviolet imaging telescope was able to see waves traveling out from solar flares, causing snow-like interference in the image sensor. Solar radiation in the extreme ultraviolet varies from minute to minute and over the sun's 11-year solar cycle. Solar activity generates tides in the Earth's atmosphere which increase with altitude. This in turn adds to the drag felt by low orbiting satellites. Communication systems can also be affected, in particular GPS services. Constantly monitoring the Sun's behavior is important, and in 2010, NASA launched the Solar Dynamics Observatory. It orbits the Earth geosynchronously at an inclination of 28 degrees, which gives it a constant view of the Sun. The SDO observes in a number of different wavelengths that correspond to different temperatures, each one revealing varying activities, from the surface to the corona and to the flaring regions. The Sun is not solid. Rather than rotating, it swirls. At the equator, it spins once every 25 days. At the poles, it takes 38 days. It's in a plasma state, extremely hot matter made up of loose electrons and ions. Plasmas are excellent conductors of electricity and the movement of the Sun generates a tangle of magnetic field lines. The surface of the Sun, known as the photosphere, has a temperature of around 6,000 degrees Kelvin and is best viewed in the visible part of the spectrum. Here, sunspots appear as dark regions where magnetic flux impedes convection. These are about the size of the Earth. Beyond the visible spectrum, magnetic loops at the same areas become visible. The lower levels of the Sun's atmosphere, the chromosphere, see gravity yielding to the dynamic thermal and magnetic forces, with temperatures increasing to 8,000 degrees Kelvin. Ascending further through the solar atmosphere, a narrow band called the transition region sees temperatures rise to more than 500,000 degrees Kelvin. In the corona, seen here during an eclipse, it rises to a million degrees Kelvin. 
Why this happens is not understood. The atmosphere is where the solar weather is generated. Solar flares appear as bright flashes, bursts of electromagnetic radiation from radio waves to gamma rays. Solar flares from some other stars are much larger than those from our Sun, and sometimes smaller stars, known as red dwarfs, display extreme solar flares. The SWIFT Gamma Ray Observatory is designed for rapidly locating brief bursts of gamma rays and X-rays. In April 2014, SWIFT saw a solar flare emanating from DGCVN. Its initial blast was 10,000 times stronger than any flare from the Sun. It was the first of seven flares that continued for two weeks. DGCVN is a red dwarf, about one-third the size of the Sun, and it rotates twice as fast as the Sun. This enables it to generate a much stronger magnetic field. It's thought that the strength of the star's magnetic field is related to the intensity of the flares it emits. Coronal mass ejections are different. They are vast clouds of plasma blasted from the Sun's outer layers. They travel with the solar wind. While they are often linked with solar flares, researchers have not been able to establish a direct relationship. Observing the Sun in different wavelengths yields very accurate temperature readings, and the dramatic rise in temperatures moving away from the surface had scientists completely baffled. In 1990, a new spacecraft was launched. Ignition and liftoff of Discovery and the Ulysses spacecraft bound for the polar regions of the Sun. The Ulysses probe was bound for the Sun, but had to go the long way. Solar researchers wanted to have a different view of our star. The solar system coalesced from a vast cloud of gas and dust. As it collapsed, it began to spin, forming a disk. All the planets orbit along the plane of this disk, called the ecliptic. Ulysses would look at the poles, the parts of the Sun that could not be seen from our terrestrial viewpoint. Ulysses travelled via Jupiter, using the giant planet's strong gravitation to change its course. It approached on a path that took it over the planet's north pole. This bent the probe's trajectory beneath the ecliptic so that it could see the sun from a polar orbit. From Ulysses, we learned that the sun's magnetic field reverses every 11 years, and that the solar wind from the more dynamic south pole was faster than from equatorial regions, yet the south pole had no clear location. The only thing clear about the sun was that it keeps changing. Now, heliophysicists wanted to be able to see the face of the sun that was not seen from Earth. Lift off of the Delta II rocket with stereo, giving us a three-dimensional look at the physics of our sun. The twin stereo probes were launched in 2006. They were in slightly different orbits, one leading the Earth and moving slightly faster, the other trailing the Earth and moving slower. Each year, the two craft separated by 44 degrees, giving each an increasingly different view of the Sun. Because the Sun rotates, sunspots can develop out of sight. As sunspots are key indicators of solar weather, it's important to know just what is about to spin into view. The stereo probes now observe the Sun in 360 degrees. This makes it much easier to plot the direction of coronal mass ejections. Though these happen with reasonable frequency, most will miss the Earth. If they hit, they create havoc in electrical systems and trigger substorms in the planet's magnetosphere. 
Information provided by the stereo satellites is being used for the protection of power grids and satellites through regular space weather bulletins. Since the 1960s, observers have been aware that auroras would sometimes brighten suddenly, with movement within the auroral curtains increasing. These were short-term phenomena, quite distinct from solar storms that result in auroral activity lasting days. As communication satellites in geosynchronous orbits became more sophisticated, they registered sudden localized falls in the Earth's magnetic field that seemed to coincide with what were now being called substorms. Three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of a Delta II rocket carrying Themis, NASA's revolutionary journey to study the Northern Lights. The Themis constellation of satellites was designed to monitor the behavior of the Earth's magnetosphere. The aim was to measure fluctuations within the Earth's magnetic field and relate any variations to changes detected in the auroras from ground stations in the North American Arctic. Each satellite was equipped with an array of booms to measure the strength and direction of electrical and magnetic fields. After several months, they maneuvered into elliptical orbits of varying eccentricity, with each reaching a high point above the night side of the Earth. The Earth's magnetic field deflects most of the plasma from the Sun. At times of high solar activity, some of the charged particles will spiral into the poles on Earth's day side. On the night side, the field lines are stretched to breaking point, called magnetic reconnection, when the plasma suddenly rebounds along the field lines into the polar regions. In February 2008, two of the probes detected a reconnection event and 96 seconds later, the ground stations registered a sudden brightening of the aurora. The giant loops bursting from the sun's surface are known as flux ropes. They are one of the most basic configurations in plasma. The glowing plasma follows helical magnetic field lines twisting around a central core. The Themis satellites discovered that flux ropes can extend all the way from the sun to the Earth's upper atmosphere, carrying currents as high as 650,000 amps. Heliophysicists remained baffled by the behavior of the sun's atmosphere, so a new probe was constructed. Known as IRIS, it was small and simple. It consisted of a telescope, an imaging spectrograph, and ancillary support equipment. It was cheap to build and cheap to launch. Iris was placed in a polar orbit of the Earth that gave it an uninterrupted view of the Sun. It was able to look at the edge of the chromosphere where the plasma began its steep increase in temperature. Its images were far more detailed than had been delivered by any other probe and it could discern rapid changes. The waving jets of plasma, called spicules, were revealed in great clarity. There are roughly 10 million spicules across the sun's surface at any given moment. They can grow to 10,000 kilometers, yet they collapse in five or 10 minutes. Researchers have made computer models of the spicules that behave in the same way as the images from Iris. It is thought that they form through the interaction of charged and neutral particles with the tangled magnetic fields. It seems magnetism must play an important role in the heating of the solar corona and in the high-speed ejection of plasma, but the mechanism is still not understood. There are at least 20 different satellites currently monitoring the Sun's behavior. Most are in orbit around the Earth. While it is important to get beyond the Earth's atmosphere to analyze the solar wind, it has not been possible to get really close to the Sun. 
Heliophysicists know the particles of the solar wind change not long after they leave the corona. If these particles could be sampled close to the sun, it would reveal what part of the solar atmosphere was responsible for their extreme heat and their ultra-high speed. Until recently, it was not possible to build a craft capable of withstanding the temperatures in regions that scientists wished to explore. The team behind the messenger probe to Mercury solved some of these problems with a woven ceramic sunshield which had to face the sun at all times. Around 2010, work began on Solar Probe Plus, designed to pass the sun just 6 million kilometers above its surface. A number of different systems have to work in concert to enable the probe to gather data inside the sun's atmosphere. A carbon composite solar shield surfaced with highly reflective alumina will shade the rest of the craft from temperature extremes. As the sun is a wideband radio source, the probe is out of contact during its close approaches and must function autonomously. In 2017, the probe was renamed the Parker Solar Probe after Eugene Parker, the physicist who had first identified the solar wind. It was the first spacecraft to be named after a living person. On a mission like this into new territory, you're going to be in for some surprises. Maybe not big ones, maybe only little ones, but you're going to find that your point of view will have to change to conform with the data. Why is the solar corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun, uh, at a million or two degrees, when the sun itself is only 5,600? It isn't because of sunshine, that's for sure. Again, we don't know until we make the flight and have a year or two to think about the data. The Parker probe's launch weight is less than 700 kilograms, which is quite modest. Yet its launch vehicle, the Delta IV Heavy, is one of the most powerful boosters available. Minus 15. In the pre-dawn hours of August the 12th, 2018, 10, the final countdown 9, was proceeding. 8, 7, Eugene Parker 6, was at Cape Canaveral to 5, watch the launch. 3, 2, 1, zero. There we go. The probe was headed for 26 highly elliptical solar orbits over seven years. During its mission, it will make seven close passes of Venus, slowing each time to sweep closer and closer to the Sun. After separation from its upper stage, the probe first deployed its solar panels. These fold back near the Sun, with a cooling system enabling them to survive. The magnetometer boom unfolded at the rear of the craft, and then the field antennae, to measure electric and magnetic fields and waves, snapped into place. Though the Parker probe leaves Earth at high speed, it uses Venus's gravity to slow down, allowing it to approach the Sun at the appropriate angle. However, as it falls toward the Sun, it will accelerate to 720,000 kilometers per hour. On its outward loops, it will lose speed, but as the mission progresses, the Parker probe will make closer passes at higher speeds. It made its first close approach of Venus after just 52 days. One month later, Parker approached the Sun. For 11 days, it was out of contact with mission control quietly recording data while carefully keeping its sun shield pointed directly at the sun. Though the heat in this region is extreme, the particle density is not. The sun shield will reach around 1,500 degrees Kelvin and the protected electronics of the spacecraft will be at room temperature. As the probe loops away from the sun, it's able to re-establish radio contact and play back the stored data. This is the first image from inside the sun's corona, 
taken during Parker's first pass. It shows a coronal streamer. The bright spot is the planet Mercury. The dark spots are image correction artifacts. The Parker probe's second and third passes were at much the same distance and speed as the first, but subsequent passes will be both lower and faster as it continues to use Venus to modify its orbit. In 2024, the Parker Solar Probe will visit Venus for the last time, and its final five passes of the Sun will come down to 6.2 million kilometers from the surface. By this time, we should have a clearer understanding of the processes that heat the solar wind and expel it at such high speeds. But whatever we learn about our Sun, it will raise new questions. A clearer understanding of the Sun has led to design changes in satellites and revised management practices of power grids and communication systems. But with new proposals to send humans back to the Moon or on planetary expeditions, we will need to understand more about the potentially hostile solar weather that flows from the star we call our Sun. <laughs>